All right, um, I'll get started then. Um, James Pepper, chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, it is February 22nd, 2022, our, our second meeting of the day on 2-22-22. Um, and uh, I'll call this meeting to order. Um, this is our typical uh, last Tuesday of the month after hours public comment session. And um, we don't have any business of the board to go over today. Um, so we're just here strictly to take public comment um, on anything that's going on. I would just say uh, before we do that, we've had kind of uh, an extensive public comment period last uh, last Friday. And so, you know, I don't I can't expect there's too much more on people's minds at this point. Um, but maybe I'm wrong and, um, you know, we'll be here for the next hour. Uh, you know, again, just we try to um, prioritize first time commenters over people who have already commented. Um, if you'd like to comment, just raise your virtual hand. And, um, you know, we try not to just answer direct questions. We do walk into kind of a little bit of a ethical gray area when we just kind of give our advice, our opinions about specific questions that relate to specific prospective licensees. But um, I will just say at the outset, um, you know, we did receive a comment last Friday about what sort of legislation the board um, or is is moving related to cannabis. Um, so I figured I might just start by addressing that issue first. Um, just so it's not kind of in response to a question, but kind of just in general, um, the board has made a number of um, recommendations to the legislature. Some of them have been um, kind of brought into uh, various pieces of legislation. Um, the first uh, and probably most important is the fee bill. Um, so our recommended fee structure has been adopted in H701 and that bill is um, kind of in the Senate currently. Uh, it's passed the House. And um, in that bill, you can see kind of the various um, license types uh, and associated tiers, and then the kind of associated fees with all of those license types and tiers um, that the House passed. Um, there will likely be some modifications in the Senate. Um, and uh, hopefully that bill kind of moves pretty quickly because obviously we can't open the market until we have um, our fees in place. Uh, another bill um, is the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, this bill contains the um, requested positions, the staff that we've asked for. And, um, you know, this bill has passed the House. The House gave us three positions. Um, the Senate uh, gave us eight positions. And right now the bill is in a conference committee. Um, and uh, the kind of, I mean, th this bill does a lot of various uh, kind of adjustments to the overall state budget. So it's, it's not specific to cannabis, but this, you know, whether we get three or eight um, or some number in between is, uh, you know, being negotiated by the House and the Senate currently. Um, we have S-188. Um, this is a bill about regulating small outdoor cultivators as farming. And um, that bill is uh, was taken up today in the Senate Finance Committee. Um, it really kind of uh, clarifies that um, small outdoor cultivators, um, you know, it kind of clarifies some of the issues that apply to um, small outdoor cultivation, including whether or not Act 250 applies, local zoning, um, what's the kind of interplay between small outdoor cannabis cultivation and the current use program and other exemptions um, for farmers. It clears up a lot of those issues. And then finally, um, there's a bill um, in the House GovOps Committee currently, H548. This is um, just kind of a technical amendments miscellaneous bill. Um, this does currently it does six things. Um, it eliminates the prohibition on solid concentrates above 60%. Um, it um, clarifies that 
cannabis products can contain both THC and CBD. Um, it allows cannabis workers uh, to move from one business, one cannabis establishment to another without having to reapply for a new um, cannabis license or a employee ID card. It allows testing facilities to operate in multiple locations. And um, it ensures that uh, all licensees, including um, integrated licensees, uh, have independent third party testing for their products. And, um, you know, we also, because we submitted a report after the introduction of this bill, um, so there might be some additions to the bill, um, you know, around allowing authorizing delivery, authorizing special event licensing, um, potentially authorizing on site consumption, online ordering. Um, and then um, giving the authority to the cannabis board to regulate synthetic cannabinoids. So those are the main pieces of legisl legislation related to our um, related to our recommendations. There's other cannabis bills that are out there, um, but those are the kind of primary ones related to recommendations that we've submitted to the legislature. So with that introduction, um, I would just open up to public comment. Um, and again, if you um, have joined via the, the link, um, join by video, feel free to raise your virtual hand. Um, once we get through kind of the initial round of those, we will um, pause and move to people that have joined by by phone. All right, if you've joined by phone and you'd like to make a public comment, um, please just uh, hit star six to unmute yourself. Hi, right, Chair Pepper, this is Ben Mervis unmuting. Hey, Ben. Would it be all right if I make comments? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, and as always, thank you for hosting these. I think this is a really important session that you all have dedicated yourselves to. Um, my comment is just about application periods and it's something that I've mentioned uh, briefly before, but I just continue to hear it from folks who are still getting themselves together to apply, still deciding what licenses they will apply for. Of course, everyone, myself included, I feel like we are against the clock for the opening bell of the market. Um, hopefully that will all be on time. But I think any communication that you all can provide um, just on future application windows, I know that it, it may not be firm information quite yet, but um, I think there's a lot of questions about, again, what if we are not ready to submit our applications during the application periods? Will the periods strictly be limited to the 30 days or will they be extended? Um, so just anything that, that you all can do on the board to, to think about that and communicate it, I think it would put some folks at ease, especially in the social uh, in the social equity cohort of folks who are not only trying to figure out what business is viable, but also looking for funding and everything else needed for the application. Um, and with that, thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. So again, um, you know, this is our public comment period. Um, we don't have any business of the board. Uh, if you'd like to make a public comment, please just raise your virtual hand. If you join by phone, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. And um, we'll try and call in the order um, that people raise their hand. If um, if no one's commenting, you know, Julie, Kyle, feel free to kind of turn your video off. Um, otherwise, um, you know, I'll I'll we'll be here for an hour regardless. So, um, Fran, do you want to join? Yes, thank you for taking my comments and for your late work hours. Um, I'm going to pick up where Amelia left off today. Uh, as I've seen, um, especially today in your meeting, uh, you are severely limited by statute. Uh, this is something, of course, that you cannot overcome at this time. But we really appreciate you bringing these points up, especially in these recorded sessions, so that we can have legislators go in and really dive a little deeper into the needs of the medical patient. Um, Amelia's right, and Tito's right. Uh, 
first of all, people need more plants immediately. Uh, I don't know why we're restricting medical patients at the legislative level, but anything you can do to uh, show uh, legislators that this is a logical and uh, safe step to take. Um, uh, you've been generous not to restrict caregivers too much. You've been generous to consider expanding caregiving, but that will not happen as I understand it right now until legislative changes are made. So we are working, we are contacting our legislators. Uh, another issue, I uh, spoke recently at a meeting in Bellows Falls and uh, I was concerned that they had just gone to a meeting with a Senator who's involved in this and not gotten any real information from them. And I wonder uh, what is going on there because we were able to, three of three of the advocates were able to inform these people better than uh, the legislators. So I'm concerned about the bills passing um, at crossover and I'm hoping that they will. I'm hoping anybody listening to us now will hear this because we've got people that have suffered through this medical program since its inception uh, one point. I said that I felt that it had failed and you uh, disagree with me to some degree, but um, my my statement is ba made based on the people that I saw that did suffer from a lack of clean, effective and affordable medicine. And in some cases suffered loss of life. So anyway, that'll be my comment for right now. And I thank you for taking it this evening. Yeah, thank you, Fran. And I, I guess I should have mentioned also at the outset that S-186, there is a bill um, that's been referred to the Senate uh, Health and Welfare Committee specifically on the medical um, side of things. It's not explicitly from our recommendations, um, but it does encapsulate a lot of the, well, I should say some of the concerns that have been brought before the board around patient to caregiver ratios, plant counts, et cetera. Thank you, but I'd say one more thing if I may. Yep. Um, in Act One, in S one eighty six, for some reason, there's a poison pill of sorts that would limit a patient uh, from being a caregiver to two patients. Uh, only a person who's not a patient could be a, a caregiver to two patients, and I don't understand that. I would be concerned about that. Um, uh, again, when we got uh, the initial uh, okay to have patients be caregivers for other patients, that was due to the fact. Uh, that was an S-16 way back, and that was due to the fact that then Governor Shumlin, uh, his father chose to use a registered patient who wasn't allowed at that time to caregive for others to to do that. And so that shows you how important caregivers are. So thank you. Yep. So um, just anyone who's joined since we started, um, you know, this is our public comment window. Uh, we don't, again, have any business of the board other than to receive public comments uh, the, uh, this evening. If you join via the phone, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. If you have uh, joined via the link, um, feel free to just raise your virtual hand. We'll call you kind of in the order that you raise your hand. And um, Otherwise, uh, we're just going to be kind of sitting here um, in silence and. Um, you know, I, I recognize that a lot of the folks that have joined tonight, um, you know, attend our meetings regularly and have provided public comment pretty regularly. Um, so maybe you feel like you don't have anything new to say, but, uh, you know, I got to just reiterate that. Um, you know, your public comments have been instrumental in kind of getting us to where we are uh, today. And um, so just feel free to kind of. You know, bring up some is the same issues. Um, otherwise, Julie, Kyle, I'm totally comfortable with you guys turning off your cameras if you guys want to kind of um, do some uh, other work while we wait for comments. Amelia? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, take a second and 
recognize all of the all of the work and all of the care that you guys have put into improving the medical program. I know that you're bound by insane restrictions and by some really crappy legislation before you. Um, but you guys have really been like a pleasure to work with for the last year. Um, and I think that all of us, at least on my team, can tell that you really do have the best interests of the patients at heart. Um, and I really don't have anything new to say. I think I've beat so many dead horses at this point. Um, but I just wanted to recognize you guys and, and say that we appreciate you. Well, thanks, Amelia. You've been with us from the beginning. Um, so we appreciate you too. I don't think it's been quite a year, but the fact that that was even mentioned is crazy to me in a sense. Getting pretty close to a year. Well, that's right. So I have one email I need to write. Uh, again, just anyone who wants to publicly comment, please just kind of chime in, raise your hand. Uh, we'll call on you or hit star six if you'd like to unmute yourself if you join via phone. Um, and um, I see maybe a three or four, three, three, four number that I'm muted. Yep. Hi, this is Ben again. Uh, oh, sorry. I just yep. wasn't sure if I had shared this before, but in case anybody has missed it, uh, Massachusetts, has, I'm not sure if they've actually moved forward with this yet, but there are discussions about moving forward with social or on-site consumption with a beta test of, I believe, the last I checked on it was six locations, and that is still exclusive to the social equity applicants. So just in case you had not seen that, um, I thought that was very exciting. Yeah, good to know. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we made that recommendation to the legislature and, um, you know, I think that the House GovOps committee is open to hearing more testimony. I don't know how, if they're willing to commit to it quite yet, but uh, um, it's nice to know that at least our, if our neighbors are doing it, then maybe we can figure it out too. It did look like a number ending in 1945, unmuted. Okay, um, yes, thank you again. Uh, this is Joseph Carter, Plainfield. Um, I raised this issue during one of the previous meetings. Um, it seems to me, and, and perhaps I, I'm not fully abreast of, of the evolution of the rules and regulations at this point, but a couple of weeks ago, my takeaway impression was that the price of admission for a tier one cultivator um, was inclusive of product liability insurance and an escrow account uh, requirement that theoretically could approximate $15,000. And that's just for that to to meet those requirements, it doesn't include any of the inputs and other uh, costs associated with being a tier one cultivator. And I'm wondering if there's been any movement on that or consideration of, of those cost, potential cost barriers to the high participation of um, small growers. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, we don't generally respond to questions directly here, um, but um, I would say that we require reasonable, uh, commercially reasonable levels of insurance, um, and the escrow is a backup if you are unable to secure insurance. So we do have specific escrow amounts, which are really to cover your liabilities for um, people that uh, are working at your facility um, or people that... Um, or for business owners. So um, it's commercially reasonable levels of insurance or an escrow account. Mm -hmm. Has there been, thank you for that. Has there been any 
how do you say, update on the possible cost of that insurance for someone who's growing 125 plants with only family and members working on the endeavor? So again, it's it's hard for us to answer your specific questions before, without us kind of getting into the gray area of us giving you advice um, or kind of providing specific legal advice to anyone. Uh, you know, they, these are kind of advisory opinions which we should really shy away from. I can say that we're having a um, banking um, and financial services uh, networking event on Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. this week. And one of the people we'll be hearing from is um, the director of uh, finances and, and um, accounting for Vermont Patients Alliance. Um, and that's a dispensary that's been in, in existence for a number of years now. They've had to get insurance um, for their operation. And one of the questions I'm going to be asking them is, what does that insurance look like? What was it like getting it? Um, what sort of potential security upgrades that you need to get in order to secure insurance. Um, just kind of walk us through that that process. So um, and that person um, will be open to questions from members of the public as well at that event. OK, thank you for that. Um, one one further related question. I've, I've heard from some people um, that they're they're getting insurance out of Colorado. Um, is there any requirement that the insurance be provided through a Vermont-based broker? So no, we don't have that as one of our requirements. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Ivan? Hi, yeah, how's it going? Uh, I do have a few questions like the gentleman just asked. Is it, instead of asking you where you can't answer, is it possible to just email uh, ccb.info to find out, answer those questions, or do I must I chime into the boards and, and ask, ask manually? It's, it's nice, you know, essentially, um, the problem is we can't kind of give specific advice to specific pr prospective applicants. But if we see kind of the same questions coming up over and over again, we can provide guidance to them, uh, guidance to the public, the general public. So it would be best uh, if you have specific questions like the prior caller um, to, to email the board, the website you just gave. And, you know, we can provide kind of I know it seems a little bit of a like two step dance, but uh, it's just easier for us instead of kind of saying, well, you know, you need to do this or you should do that. Uh, it's for us to kind of give general guidance to the public on all of these issues. Yeah, no worries. That makes sense. Uh, it's quite literally questions, just something like an application checklist, just things I want to make sure I have an order to apply, you know, mm -hmm. simple things that I've read the regulations, I've read everything. I mean, they're just small bits in between that I just want to make sure. And I guess, yeah, it would be pertaining to us personally, but um, mostly general generality as well so i'll do that yeah. Thank you. i i can say that you know we recognize that our regulations leave some am ambiguity um i mean just think uh about just commercially reasonable levels of insurance or kind of what can you add to kind of cannabis products if you're you know creating an, an edible for instance or you know so what we intend to do is to have both policies and guidance that are kind of easily accessible, easily digestible for folks to walk through um, all the areas that might be ambiguous. And that's why it's very helpful for us to hear the questions so that when we create that guidance document that we can make sure that we're addressing um, kind of people's specific questions. And Pepper, I don't know, I don't know if you did mention it, but uh, Thursday as part of your um, the conversation you're leading, I, I know that you're planning at least to go over some of the, the pre-qualification, you know, application um, parameters. I don't, I don't know if now is a, a time to to say whether or not we're at a point where we can start sharing things, because <laughs> I know we're rushing to to make sure we're ready, but that, that might help alleviate some of Ivan's, um, you know, initial concerns as, as it relates to the application. Yeah, if you're able to tune in, um, 
on Thursday from five to seven. I think um, that's more of a kind of question and answer format situation. Um, so I, I think that, you know, when it comes to the pre-qualification process, certainly when it comes to kind of banking or insurance issues, our panelists, um, you know, we have a person from VSECU that's been um, in charge of kind of their cannabis portfolio. Um, so the the person who's kind of in, you know, we have three dispensaries. Uh, they are all banking with one institution. So that you know, VSECU is coming to kind of discuss their perspective about banking. Um, then we have, you know, one of the dispensaries kind of directors coming to talk about their perspective as a licensee about banking. Then we have um, the person who kind of literally wrote the book or the chapter of the larger book about cannabis banking, um, uh, kind of giving us a broad picture of the national um, situation with cannabis banking. And then I'll be discussing the um, pre-qualification process. So that that's kind of going to be at our event on Thursday. And our panelists certainly are able to kind of answer questions to the best of their ability. And um, I'm, I'll be there to kind of discuss um, and answer questions about our pre-qualification process. And, and just another, and just another general comment because you kind of alluded to fact the fact that we do have some ambiguous language uh, amongst a lot of our rules. Just just for folks listening, I think between the three of us, there's like ten to fifteen guidance and policy documents currently being drafted and worked on and reviewed by staff and agency partners and other um, you know around state government. So there's a lot of information kind of coming. We recognize that it's not all out yet, but. Um, you know, we're working on everything. So I'll just mention again um, to anyone who's joined since we started, um, this is our kind of public comment uh, after hours, public comment period. Um, you know, we're trying to accommodate people that can't join our meetings or stick around throughout all of them waiting for our public comment period. So, um, you know, if you have a public comment um, about anything we're doing um, or specifically about any of the rules we've drafted, um, you know, now's, now's the time. Um, this isn't the last time, but now's a good time to kind of raise those with us. And, um, you know, if no one's commenting, um, we're going to just sit here until um, seven o'clock. And so feel free to kind of maybe think about your question, but anytime you want to make, make a comment, um, just jump right in. Um, this is uh, Joseph Carter again. Yep. Um, not to belabor the point, but um, Though your language concerning insurance may be vague, it's my understanding from talking to some people in the insurance industry, they have sort of a minimum level of coverage. And currently the premium on that, that's for everybody. Not, it's not on an individual basis. It's just what the insurance industry would charge in Vermont for uh, insurance despite your category of participation, tier one, manufacturer, whatever, the minimum insurance is currently uh, gonna cost around $7,500. So uh, I'm wondering in the meeting on Thursday, is there gonna be someone there from the insurance industry to talk about this? So no, this the meeting on Wednesday is mostly around banking. Um, however, I was going to just talk to um, our panelist who who's a dispensary director about the insurance question. So um, he will, you know, having been through this um, for kind of a small to medium sized grow operation in, in Montpelier, he'll he'll be able to kind of speak to what hoops he had to jump through and and what the kind of conversation was like with his insurer. But no, we don't have anyone specifically from the insurance company is coming. And, you know, again, we, we're not trying to endorse any one insurance company. We're not trying to give the impression that we're endorsing anyone. So really, it's hard for us to kind of 
bring in an insurer and say, you know, this is the company that's willing to do this. Um, you know, so we're trying to kind of keep things general with, you know, a, a financial institution that's actually banked cannabis money here in Vermont, an actual licensee who's had to deal with banking and insurance issues, and then one of our personal consultants um, that can talk about the kind of uh, national national scene and, and what to expect, um, you know, maybe down the road and what to expect if no insurance companies in Vermont or financial institutions in Vermont are willing to kind of step up and fill this kind of gap. Mm -hmm. um, so that's encouraging. Uh, is there someone who could come from the Vermont uh, insurance, State Insurance Commission? At it's some possible. point, maybe on the Thursday. Yep, it's possible, for sure. We can kind of put that in the queue of, of potential issues to deal with. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Tree frog. Hey, um, so this is kind of just a, a comment as to what I've seen. Um, I know I was late to this meeting, so it might have been discussed or commented or planned on for the Thursday meeting. But in terms of the pre-qualifications, um, and this will be true for the applications, just in trying to get fingerprinted, um, I can't get fingerprints until they have a number um, associated to an agency to send those fingerprints for the federal background checks. Um, when I talked to the guy in Waterbury, he said that you guys were working on that with the federal government to try to get some kind of released form for us to follow. I didn't know if that's something you guys are working on or were aware of it or where that stood. Um, and as far as I understand, the VCIC is where I can get my state record. The, the fingerprints are for a federal background check and you're gonna require both of those, right? Yeah, so um, everything that we require is in statute. Um, feel free to kind of peruse Title VII um, in, around cannabis. And, um, you, you know, it, we can't get around what's required by statute. Um, and so, yes, we are going to require a fingerprint supported background check and a state background check. Um, it can be done simultaneously. I will, you know, this question specifically, I will be addressing on Thursday. So I'd prefer to just do it in that venue because um, I'm sure I will have to cover it there as well. Some of that information is on our website, right, Pepper? I believe it is. Yeah, yes. I think Nell's put up. cp.vermont.gov slash qualify, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I've seen most of what the qualifications were. I guess my, I, I figured that the background, the fingerprinting would be for the federal check and that the, C, the VCIC is for the state. My only real concern was that the the required form with the number um, for the fingerprinting, because I've been told I can't get fingerprints done at all without that, that they, they won't just fingerprint and turn it over to a person for fear of contamination or, you know, other things. So I was I was just curious to make sure that, that we were going to get that number and that we weren't going to have to try to sidestep this whole thing. But it sounds like you guys are working on that and about that. Yeah. All right. I, I'm I guess I'm go into it now. I mean, essentially what's going on is that the federal government, the FBI, needs to approve our application to receive fingerprints through VCIC, um, the Vermont Center for Crime Inf or the Vermont Crime Information Center. Um, they have not done that. Um, you know, there's about 300 agencies in Vermont that are approved to receive fingerprints. Um, you know, whenever the legislature authorizes a new agency, they have to send a letter to the Fe to the federal government, the FBI. They need to approve it. They seem to be backlogged right now, um, and you know because we submitted this uh, last year, um, and uh, so we expect it to happen any day. But I guess the kind of bottom line is is don't rush out to get fingerprinted right now. Um, you know the window has not opened yet. Um, for pre-qualification and, um, you know, there's no real rush to get your fingerprints done right now. Um, 
And if we do not get that authorization authorization by March 16th, which is when the window for pre qualification opens, then we do have an alternative and um, we can kind of walk people through that on at the event on Thursday. That sounds exciting to hear. That sounds perfect. Um, my other question, I guess, would be, do you still envision us being on target for May 1st licenses being distributed, or do you guys seeing any hangups as we come into the final home stretch of this? So um, I really want to avoid answering direct questions. I'll do this one last time, <laughs> but uh, essentially, um, we have done everything we can as a board to be prepared for issuing licenses on May 1st. Um, there now are, we're at the point where there are only things that are outside of our control that will dictate whether or not we can actually do that. Um, one, a fee bill has to be passed. Um, we can't open any licensing windows without a fee bill being passed. Um, two, we need staff to actually review those licenses. Um, currently, um, you know, there's a negotiation happening between the House and the Senate between uh, how much or any when they're going to give us any sort of staff. Um, three, we need to have a licensing portal open. Um, we are we have signed a contract um, with a company to create a licensing portal um, and they know that it needs to happen by April 1st. Um, and so that the wheels are in motion there. So. All of those things are somewhat outside of our control, and we need this fingerprint um, issue resolved as well. So, um, you know, from a purely kind of a regulatory standpoint, we're ready to go as a board, um, but those other pieces need to fall into place. Um, Nate. Hi, thanks for um, taking this time. I really appreciate it. What you guys are doing here. Um, my question is if um, when even one of you could speak to whether uh, franchises will be allowed to uh, enter the Vermont cannabis space, particularly as uh, retailers. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, so the, I mean, the short answer is no. And that's, um, that's, there's a statutory provision that prevents franchises in the state. Understood. Thank you. Yep. So again, um, you know, just we're here, um, to receive public comments, um, you know, we are trying to kind of expand our uh, access to the public. Um, so we hold these kind of once a month after our public comment sessions. Um, if you have uh, any comments at all, please feel free to kind of chime in. Um, you know, you can hit star six to unmute your phone, or you can just kind of raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll try and call on you and then, well, we'll call on you as soon as you raise your hand. <laughs> this point. Um, Ivan? 
Uh, would it be possible to open up the uh, the text chat feature if anyone would want to network? I mean, I would share my info with anyone you know to to connect with. Is that possible or no? So I would just say because of the public records laws, we would have to publish the chat. So we just decided to disable it. It's it's a little bit easier for us. Um, and there's some gray areas about what's a public comment and what's um, kind of a side conversation. So. Um, yeah, that's the that's the that's the exciting that's the exciting part about COVID and all these you know software teams. What is a public record? I will say, um, the three of us typically don't join all together at the after hours um, events that have that are going to be happening every other Thursday. This one, this Thursday, um, and that's so we don't inevitably create a public record, or one of the one of the reasons, and to give folks that comfortability. So the chat feature will be um, available on Thursday. I was just going to say that our our the chat's been very active in those after hours meetings, uh, but again, it's not it's not a formal board meeting, so the rules are different. Gotcha. Completely understand. Thank you, Jared. Yeah. Hi. I don't know how to phrase this. It's not going to sound like a question, but will there be? Uh, tax on wholesale uh, sales to retailers? I know that sounds like a question. So. <laughs> Is that something you can answer? You know, I can direct you to the section of the law about taxes, and I can direct you to a bill that's proposing to um, impose a wholesaler tax? Um, I guess the short answer is no. Um, no, you can't answer or no, there won't be. No, there's no tax on wholesales, uh, except there is a bill that is proposing to impose one. The reason I ask is because I've read that in California, particularly, the taxes are so high and the supply is great, driving down prices that a lot of the supply is being siphoned off into the black market just because they can't finance their legal growth business. Uh, that's that's a comment. Yeah, thanks for that. It's always helpful to kind of get, get a pers national perspective on what other states are going through. Benjamin? Hello. Uh, thanks for everything you guys do. Um, I just joined, and uh, sorry if this was already covered, but um, I just want to try to clarify on some of the fencing requirements for outdoor cultivation. Um, for example, I'm wondering if I have a six foot fence um, woven wire with barbed wire on top, and I also have all of the you know um, applicable uh, measures like floodlight security cameras and all those check marks for uh, my tier grow is that uh, going to be sufficient fencing thank you yeah so i mean um again we, we try not to answer questions uh during these sessions i know i've been breaking that kind of cardinal rule a couple times but it's specifically for these reasons. If we if I if we were to give you an answer right now, that's not legally binding, but you would probably take it as such, and then you would might do it. Uh, and so, I mean, we just can't give advisory opinions like that um, during these meetings. So I'm sorry. Um, you know, if you want to submit your question um, to the board, um, you know, again, we I, we do collect these questions, and, and it's not going to get lost on us. That there's questions around fencing and and what's required and what's allowable and what's not. We are producing, um, as Kyle mentioned, a guidance document specifically around security requirements for outdoor and indoor cultivation that will have um, guidance uh, to, you know, prospective licensees about this issue. But we we can't answer kind of um, every potential hypothetical here because um, it just gets us down to a road where you, you all are relying on our comments um 
in our in our responses. Um, and we just can't kind of get into that position um, now. But I will say that we recognize that there are a lot of questions. The licensing is right around the corner. And, um, you know, we are in the midst of providing extensive guidance documents on every aspect of our rules. Okay, well, thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Pepper. I appreciate everything you guys do. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. We will we will have a, a guidance document specifically around fencing, uh, as Pepper alluded to. And, and if I can't remember what the date of, of that meeting was, where we had like a, a robust discussion around fencing a couple weeks ago. But if you go to Orca and sift back a couple Mondays, there was a, a presentation that I did specifically on what we would consider appropriate fencing. Is it right to say, Pepper, that? Um... You know, some of these questions could be answered for folks through the pre-qualification process. You know, if they're putting forward some of their information, um, it's an opportunity to to sort of put like a draft in front of the board and get that pre-qualification approval. Is that, I mean, I mean, probably not for fencing, but for some of the other questions that we're getting, is that a good opportunity for folks if they're doing the pre-qualification process? Um on this issue i would say probably not um you know pre-qualification really is about ensuring that um prospective licensees aren't going aren't making capital expenditures um without getting some clearance from the board that they can actually participate and i say that um because there are because of the dual status of cannabis because it's federally illegal there are certain people that the board has to categorically disqualify from owning a cannabis license. Um, those are folks just from a very general standpoint that have ties to organized crime, that have kind of recent embezzlement or fraud convictions, um, you know, everything that's contained in the FinCEN guidance. And so really the pre-qualification process is aimed at um, ensuring that um, anyone who wants to participate in this industry um, kind of puts forward um, you know their financiers their kind of business partners and ensuring that all of those folks can act can actually are actually qualified to eventually get a license so i don't think um, fencing or kind of security requirements would fit into that i think it's just too much of a kind of strain on the board to kind of focus on pre-qualifying folks and then also kind of pre-qualifying people's business plans or kind of specific aspects of their business plans. Real quick, I know I just spoke, but Kyle, uh, could you uh, maybe point me in the direction to that specific talk that you uh, you were talking about there uh, in regards to fencing? You're muted, Kyle. It was probably the 7th, right? February 7th. They all honestly have blended together in my, <laughs> the weeks have blended together. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, let me, let me look it up really quick and I'll just, I'll just, um, I'll share that out loud. Give me one second. So I think it was on the 6th of February. Does that sound right? Is that a Sunday? Maybe that's the day I made the presentation. <laughs> yes, it was probably the 7th. I mean, yeah, it definitely was the 7th. If you go to Orca Media and you just explore and you search the Cannabis Control Board as a keyword, they should have all of our um, our videos up there. Thank you.
So um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, you know, it's just uh, for the last time is their public comment session. Um, you know, this is an after hours meeting. We, we generally hold board meetings on um, Mondays at 11 where we actually do kind of substantive work. Um, we have we held one earlier today on rules three and four. Um, and um, but but these are an opportunity for people to kind of give us direction, give us comments, give us their concerns, their thoughts. Um, let us know the direction they'd like um, the board to go in any number of areas, either kind of more short term or more long term. Um, and um, we try not to answer questions uh, just because uh, for some of the reasons I've stated in the past. Um, but, um, you know, we do collect questions and try and, you know, have them shape our guidance documents, which we are in the process of drafting. Um, so if anyone has, uh, again, any comments, um, feel free to just kind of chime in. Um, you can hit star six to unmute your phone um, if you join by phone. Um, you can raise your kind of virtual hand if you if you want to do it that way. Um, you know, just a few other things to note. Um, uh, I'll be on Vermont Vermont edition tomorrow at noon um, with Susanna Davis um, and Karen Horn from the League of Cities and Towns. Um, we're doing our kind of traditional uh, or kind of our, our new kind of networking events, social equity, economic empowerment, networking event on Thursday um, from five to seven. The kind of link is available on our website. Um, that one is specifically going to be around banking and um, financial services. Um, we have a number of panelists that have experience um, in those areas uh, that can really answer questions. Um, and again, that session is devoted to kind of networking. Um, so the chat will be live. People can ask questions. We'll try our best to provide answers. Um, and, um, you know, uh, other than that, you know, feel free to kind of just give us your thoughts for the next couple of minutes here. Adam from So I saw, I guess, two phones unmuted. What is that, Ben and um, one that ends in 2594? Ben, do you want to just yeah, go Adam. first? Or Adam, do you want to go first? Sure. I just, I was wondering if you could point me in the direction of, uh, so if you, if you were doing a, a, a applying for like a mixed tier, um, a small mixed tier, tier one mixed tier license and uh, you're here go and make edibles and 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 but cultivate um for your edibles to make an extract do you need uh a manufacturing the same manufacturing license that people who are selling extracts um externally would need uh if you're if you are only you're not selling, uh, selling them and you're only using them for your line of edibles well, where i could find more information about that so I think the the best place to look on that would be our our rule number two, which is available on our website. And if you just kind of look at the table of contents around product manufacturers, you can see what the kind of various tiers are allowed to do. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, ben, did you have a comment? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I will try to phrase this as a comment. Um, I may have missed it, so I, I apologize if I have, but if I have not missed this and the guidance or the rule does not exist, um, I was thinking about lab testing recently, uh, specifically when it comes to dosing, because um, this is something that has come up in other established markets when a product either um, tests under or over the dose that it's labeled as, so say, uh, you know, by, by statute, I believe we're required to have five milligram dosing with products. So a chocolate bar that's 50 milligrams, 10 pieces at five milligrams a piece goes to the lab. And it turns out that the pieces are testing closer to four and a half milligrams or even five and a half milligrams, putting the, uh, the product total over 50 or by violating one, one requirement or the other. Um, you know, some states have 
allowances there, you know, 10% over or under means that all you have to do is relabel, but the product can still pass testing. Um, so again, just a comment wise, if that guidance, if that rule doesn't exist somewhere that specifically acknowledges not every product is going to be exactly five milligrams per dose and 50 milligrams per package, um, that, that type of rule requirement or guidance would be crucial once the market is standing up. So thank you. Yeah, so I'm just, I have rule two up in front of me, so I'll just point you to 2.9.2, .2, and then we do have kind of um, allowable variances um, in potency. Excellent, thank you. Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, once again, I apologize in advance because I'm going to violate your request not to pose a question, but I don't know how else to, to formulate this, but it's a, I think it's a benign question. Um, you mentioned that you're developing guidance documents. Will it include guidance on the escrow um, requirements, specifically in terms of dollar amounts? So I don't have the rules in front of me, but I do think that we get very specific on kind of escrow amounts for various license types, and it's different based upon the license type. And I think it's rule one, possibly rule two. I actually think it's rule two now that I think okay. about it. And it's it's yep. divided out by license type. So, you know, small cultivators need a different escrow amount if they can't secure insurance or if they would prefer an escrow account to insurance. Um, there are specific ones for small cultivators versus large cultivators versus product manufacturers, et cetera. So is it correct to, to understand that escrow could function, an escrow deposit could function as an alternative to um insurance for a tier one small grower that's the idea yep that's great okay fantastic it's in Thank rule you. one i think pepper 1.4.5 i think okay. yep great 1.4.5 you, you can look in there and see kind of what the alternatives to insurance are who holds that money so the idea would be a bank would hold it, a financial institution. Designated by the CCB, by the state? Um, designated by, I mean, you, you just need to kind of show proof of the account uh, to the board. It's not. Okay. Great, thank you. Yep. So any last comments? I see that, you know, we're a minute away from seven. Um, and uh, yeah, and I know um, I know that there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of questions out there. We're, we're trying our best to kind of collect them and, and try and answer them in a, in a kind of systematic way. Um, and I know it's frustrating, um, but, um, you know, uh, if there's any last kind of questions or, or comments, happy to take them. Amelia? Okay, I'm going to be really, really annoying for like two seconds. I'm sorry. But um, I know you guys were trying to stream on YouTube the other day, and it didn't work out. Uh, I would say um, the better way to reach people would be if you're trying to add another streaming place, go on Instagram Live, because that's where all of the growers hang out. <laughs> and that's where a majority of them will be able to come in and see all uh, there's a lot of misinformation like getting thrown around the grower community right now, obviously, as is going to happen right before any market opens. Um, and I think for clarity's sake, I know I have been on your on your butts about Instagram and I know that you just don't have the staffing for it right now or the budget. But if you're trying to add another streaming area, I would recommend going there before you go to YouTube. That was all. 
yeah, I think, understood. <laughs> I think Nelly told told us she was successful with YouTube today, for what it's worth. But that was kind of a soft launch. Yeah. But appreciate that, Amelia. Town meeting day is one week from today. I can't help myself. It's the justice of the peace in me to remind everybody to get out and vote and get involved in their local government. Yeah, this this is the issue of whether to allow retail establishments within your jurisdiction is on at least 20 ballots um, for town meeting day. So, uh, you know, it's a really important one for the kind of proper functioning of the market um, to get that approved in as many towns as possible. And you can register to vote um, even at the polls. Any uh, any final uh, comments from people either on the phone or uh, that joined via the link? Uh, I was just going to say I looked real quick and I couldn't find um, that video on the 7th. It doesn't seem like it's posted. Uh, that's all. Thank you. If you could reach out to Nelly, um, I think she does have a way of kind of accelerating the posting of those. So, you know, Nellie's web or email address should be pretty readily available on our board. Or if you just submit a comment, um, just asking for the video from February 7th, um, that should, she should be able to get it to you. Thank you. All right. Well, th thank you all for the comments. Um, again, I know that there's more questions than there are answers right now. Um, we do all recognize that uh, we are trying to really focus our attention now that our rules are kind of on their way to their next phase um, to focus on guidance and policy um, to help kind of fill in these gaps. Uh, and so continue to kind of submit your comments, your questions. We do have a kind of online portal uh, to receive those. Um, but thank thank you all for the, the time tonight. Um, we have again another event tomorrow or on Thursday from five to seven, and um, hopefully we see you all there. Um, otherwise, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you.